Thank you, Linda. Um, hi, everybody. So the topic for today is the, the nodes ingress and transit into Sagittarius and Gemini axis. And I don't think you can see the picture very well. Uh, or maybe you can. It's just that we have those, um, we have our cameras right on it. Uh, the reason why I chose this picture is because it uh, combines the more Western tropical uh, astrology or symbols with uh, the Vedic. And I'm really um, interested or invested in mixing and kind of combining both traditions in a very Sagittarius Gemini way, uh, as we will explain later how this is like the, kind of the merging or the integration of left and right brain or east and west. So, um, so what is it with um, snakes or dragons? Because this is the story, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Rahu and Ketu and the Vedic tradition myth of creation, but they represent the North and South Node. And this is like the dragon's head and the dragon's tail. And I'll tell you the story in a little bit, but what is it with evolution and the unfolding of life and dragons and serpents? If, this is just kind of food for thought as we move into this. We can see it everywhere in the patterning of the universe, um, our galaxies, shells, our DNA. And in every tradition, we associate this sort of serp serpentine and this mythological creatures with the unfoldment of life and evolution. And uh, in Vedic tradition, it is the dragon's head and the dragon's tail. So um, the story goes, um, the devas and the asuras, the demons and the angels were in a long, never-ending battle. So the devas or the angels went to Lord Brahma and asked for help. And Lord Brahma directed them to uh, Vishnu, the preserver of the universe, who told them, well, if you get together with the asuras and turn the cosmic ocean together, you can... Um, out of it, this till the Amrita or the elixir of immortality. And in this way, you can drink it, not give it to them. And in this way, you can recover your powers. Because the story comes from before, and it's a very long story, like all the Vedic stories. So I'm not going to go there. So you can recover your powers as they as they best, and finally um, defeat the Asuras. So right here, we can see that for differentiation to come and life to come, the opposites have to have to kind of work together, the positive and the negative. And this will be important to remember when we go into the nodes, how to integrate them as opposed to this is bad, this is good, we need to leave one behind and just get the other. So as they went on um, turning the, milk, the cosmic ocean of milk, they used um, the serpent dragon Vasoki to, to turn it and they together did it. And out of this cosmic nothingness or cosmic soup, all things began to emerge. Galaxies, planets, and this is like how the universe got created. So um, at the very end, um, the Vishnu decided to kind of trick the, the Asuras and um, turn himself into Mohini, the most beautiful woman that there has ever lived and kind of distracted them. And he said he was going to serve, or she at this point sir, said he was going to serve the Amrita and they had to separate in different roles. And he was just going to serve it to the Devas and not to them. But one of the, the serpent, Vasoki, got in between um, Chandra and Surya, moon and sun, and got a drink of it. Kind of sneak, snuck in there and got a drink from it. So as soon as Vishnu, as Mohini saw this, split it in half, but it was too late. He was already immortal. So he became the dragon split in two, or Rahu, which is the dragon without a tail, and Ketu, the tail without a head, in between sun and moon. And in every eclipse, they devour either the sun or the moon. And that's the story. And I kind of wanted to tell the story to bring the symbolism together when we go and explore the archetypal and the symbolism of each node and how to work with them. So we can go into the next slide. I don't know how familiar you are with um, the nodes and the actual astronomical aspect of them, um,
but this is, I picked this because I did this as a live presentation and there were all kinds of people that didn't even know what they were. So if it's repetitive, just bear with me. Um, are not, as many of you know, they're not physical objects, but they are points in the sky where the um, ecliptic or the sun's path along the vault of the constellations and the lunar path cross with each other, as you can see on the right um, image, which is simpler. And then on the left image, you can see how when they shift, they point to different signs across the ecliptic or the vault. So when they, when they shift into, right now they are aligned with Capricorn Cancer and as they shift, it will align with Sagittarius Gemini. So the ascending with the North Node and the descending with the South Node. Any questions about this or what happened before the story? At any time, please ask any questions because I just don't want to be talking. And if you have questions, you can definitely ask and we can make this interactive. Next slide, Linda. Thank you. So now we're going to go into the uh, archetypes for each. So the ingress will be on May 5th of 2020, and they will stay in Gemini Sagittarius until January 18th of 2022. So as you remember the story I just told, Rahu, the dragon without a tail, we can think about what this means as wherever that North Node is, we're going to have a tendency for wanting more and more a sort of insatiability. The ability to gather and grasp at more information and more things, but maybe not the ability to truly digest them and integrate them yet. Remember, there's nothing holding underneath that dragon. There isn't that digestive. And for the opposite, for K2, we have the container. We have that everything is there, but nothing new comes in. So with this, we have that from the south node, we can get a lot of integrated lessons, but also a lot of stagnant uh, information. And this is in patterns, this is what we can default back into kind of unconsciously because it's familiar, because we know it, because we know it so well, it's been sitting there for a while. And the main thing is here to bring those two together to create a whole and integrate um, the polarities. Not just, I'm kind of not on the, on the school of thought that says, oh, one is past, one is future, one is good versus bad. This is, to me, too simplistic. There's more to the story. There's more to what we're doing here to just make it black and white like that. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I should have known this, but is the north going to be Gemini and the south Sag? It's going to be the opposite. So the north node is going to be Gemini. Did you say that? And the south node is going to be Sagittarius. So we're going to start then with the south node, which is going to be entering Sagittarius. So when we think of Sagittarius as an archetype, um, it's a huge archetype. And, um, and just itself, ruled by Zeus, everything about it is big. And um, Sagittarius as an architect tries to um, create a philosophy of life. Of ex it explores reality, the truth of reality to arrive at a conclusion, a philosophy, as a, as a system that it can use to interface with reality. If you look at the symbol of Sagittarius, there is half human, it's a centaur, half human, half um, animal. So it's also pointing to how we're integrating both the animal, the lower self and the higher self. The arrow is always pointing outward and act into the future. So there's a tendency in Sagittarius to actually move forward, never look back too much. And um, quite impatiently and as a fire sign, very much sometimes without considering the facts, just going forward. And the arrow also symbolizes projections, how we are projecting outside of ourselves. So something important with the south node transiting here is going to be uh, the withdrawal of these projections. And it is where we um, create belief systems out of 
as going into the world as a Sagittarian archetype, going into either external journeys or internal journeys to explore the nature of reality. And out of these direct experiences that we begin to have as a collective as individuals within this archetype, we begin to form an idea of the truth. Now, what tends to happen since there is through direct experience we tend to believe that this is the whole truth for everybody. And this is where the shadow aspect of Sagittarius begins to be the need to convert and convert and convince others of the truth that I just found that it feels so real to me. It should be everybody's. This is where we find fanaticism, religious. This is why sometimes it's associated with religious fanaticism, us versus them. So we need, really need to watch for this in the collective as we move through it in May, how a lot of this may come up to the surface again, this whole, and the more uh, collective arena, this whole religious war that we seem to have with the other religions, like, oh, they're evil, and we have to wage war against them, because we hold the truth. And it can happen in any kind of institutions that we have, and it can happen with us. Mm -hmm. um, did you say that with the south node in Sagittarius, there is a withdrawal of projections? There is the need, not necessarily. There is the projection outward and the need for us, if we're going to work and evolve through it and not get stuck in the shadowy aspects of the archetype. Because south node, remember, is where we can be so comfortable. We bring a lot of wisdom from the Sagittarian archetype, but we can also get stuck in the shadowy aspect. So. The intention is to withdraw projection. And if you okay. look at Gemini, Gemini is very good at analyzing everything and seeing all points, all sides. Okay, can you say that again? There is a tendency to withdraw projection? A tendency to project outwards. If you look at the arrow, it's pointing outwards into the future outside of yourself. So there is a tendency to throw that arrow outward, outside of yourself and project it outside. And is there a problem with by withdrawing our projections? That's the, the intention to make it about us, make it about objectify the reality instead of seeing what's ours in another and fighting that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. That's a good question. And this is something that I've never heard about this, uh, this uh, archetype. Um, beginning to study archetypal um, astrology and it it's something that I that I got from that school of astrology but it was super interesting once I saw it and uh, I have a lot of Sagittarius and I, I could see how it it can definitely show up that way I mention it because uh, I find I have I have Sag rising and my mm -hmm. Mars in Sag and when I repress my impulse to express my withdraw my projection I have to be careful about I have to be aware of that mm -hmm. because it can ignite explode you. and I'm not saying withdraw your expression but to be careful of whether that expression it's just an arrow being shoot up somebody or is this something a truth you have to express in an objective kind of way of owning your own part of it barbara mm -hmm. i'm just wondering if you could please explain that these are the nodes of the moon and therefore emotional and our inner world perhaps that will help damon to understand that's true that's great linda yes so yeah. Definitely. Being the, the moon nodes, the moon has everything to do with our emotional inner world. How we find comfort, how we find security in the world is mother, is how we formed our self-image in the womb and in the beginning of our developmental years. Um, it's all our emotional inner reality. And I think this has to do with um, the projection that we can have can kind of come out and project our own emotional reality onto another. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hi, can you hear me?
can I, this is Shay. I have something I just want to kind of bring up really quick that just to show how that is what you're saying is manifesting with me. Um, right now in this very moment, I ended up, um, connecting with a soulmate twin flame and the same thing is playing out. He's like across, across the world and he's big, um, into the vet, the Vedic and he is kind of, I feel trying to really convert me to his way of thinking, even though we were mirroring each other. So exactly what you're saying is exactly playing out with me right now. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing. And also we both have, now I don't know, you know, but in Western, both of our North nodes are in the ninth house and both of our South nodes are opposite. Wow. Okay. So a lot of Sagittarian, um, archetype and energy there for you for you too right mm -hmm. yeah i don't have your chart right in front of me right now uh but i will definitely look at it and we can go into into it a little more deeply if that's okay sure yeah That'd be interesting and it'll be a little different uh where the south node and the north node falls into the in in terms of houses i think for the mm -hmm. For, yeah, for Western astrology, but we can still kind of look at the how they both um, kind of overlap and interplay. So let me see. I think I was still on the archetypes, not yet the ingress, but we can have the ingress chart there. Um, so, um, so as far as the South Node and Sagittarius, we will um, a lot of the time. I think most of the time, uh, Jupiter, which is the ruler of Sagittarius, will still be in Capricorn and then it'll move into Aquarius. So for a long time, we're going to have um, that it's still the structures of our entire systems, educational, religious, political, with that being in Capricorn, the ruler being in Capricorn and then and the South not being in Sagittarius, that what we need to release, it's any kind of fanaticism, any kind of like uh, generalization of the truth of what we think works or what doesn't work, we're going to, as a collective, I think we're going to be working through this. Probably a lot of revision in the legal system will happen as well. Uh, Sagittarius is connected to the legal systems through Zeus being, um, and one of the Olympian gods, he was the, um, the one that dispensed uh, judgment and during the Greek time. He was the judge. And I think this is where the connection with Sagittarius and the, um, the legal system comes into play. Um, so we need to also release our ideas about what we hold as truth and be more open to the diversity of what that means for other people. Um, let me see what else. Uh, there can be with Sagittarius an excessive um, unrealistic optimism that we need to watch for as well. And in a kind of a need of just going forward without even, even looking at the foundation or really analyzing what's going on and to generalize. So we may or we could see um, like the fanaticism and religious and religion, uh, especially because um, the elections are going to take place during this nodal placement. So we can see that that becomes part of the debate, you know, for the, for the candidates especially on the more conservative side, when um, the shadowy aspect of Sagittarius can be kind of like conservative, which is very opposed to its um, other aspect that is very exploratory and shamanic and connected to natural law. So what we need to bring as a collective is the, those aspects of Sagittarius and bring it into Gemini and combine it with that. Kind of release the shadowy and embrace a more natural way of living that can also happen during this south node how we can can we start implementing this more organic natural ways of living shamanic into the diversity of the community that we have and, the, and there we go to gemini how can we bring this message this truth and communicate it in a way that can be heard by everybody not just my group, 
or this group or this religious um, grouping or the astrological community, but by everybody, because this is Gemini. It's, now we're going to Gemini as an archetype, is the archetype of diversity, of curiosity for life. It's the archetype of the puer, the eternal youth, that child that is just kind of exploring the world with that kind of sense of wonder, not really judging it or classifying it too much. It classifies it, but in order to have an idea where everything fits, but not really to have a judgment about it. That doesn't really happen in Gemini. So the ability to be able to look at all of the facts and analyze them instead of just proclaim some truth as the truth will be very key for us as a collective as we move in. Um, let me see. And there was something interesting about Gemini. Um, and this is where we can bring the wisdom that we have distilled in the Sagittarian archetype in the South Node, is that if the mind, which is represented by Gemini, is just left without any wisdom, without any intuition for truth, as Jung pointed out, the mind is amoral, it's dual. This is the opposite, it's the twins, kind of just being both. So unless we can see beyond worth, beyond the plain facts and use that intuition, that Sagittarian intuition to, to distill the truth from it, then we're just caught up in whatever. We can justify anything as good or bad. So that is the danger of the Gemini archetype, the insatiability of Rahu being just, let's just go for, just for the mind, just for the rational, for the thinking, without that more intuitive, uh, area that Sagittarius brings. Um, it's going to be a great time to explore diversity, to share, and if we're really using this the way it should be, to bring all that wisdom and be able to share it with everybody. That would be the ideal. That would be how we can, okay, I come from a different understanding of the truth and you have this one. I can accept it. We are diverse. We know that the truth with uppercase, uppercase truth or big words or big letters. It's just one truth, but there are many ways of expressing it. So the, I think we can go into the ingress chart and I think um, more will come up as we're going through this, because I don't know how we're doing on time, Linda. Okay, it's half an hour. So uh, in the ingress chart, Like I said before, Jupiter, the ruler, is still in Capricorn. So it's still pointing to those um, long-term goals that we need to have in order to restructure our, our reality, our systems. This is Capricorn, the container of reality. And that um, we've been having a lot of Earth and a lot of Capricorn energy that was kind of heavy and we're kind of moving through it. And I think once this nodes shift, we're going to get that, like, that sensation of... Uh, breath of um, fresh air, like fire, air, like there's more here to like, more lightness. So we can actually catch up to that momentum and we can bring a lot of positive um, growth and transformation if we apply it right, if we don't fall for the shadow aspects. At that point, Saturn has, is going to be in Aquarius, one degree Aquarius, so that again is going to point to the new way of of doing things, the new, uh, the new way of defining humanity, who we are in the context of, of the bigger reality. Um, with Aquarius, we can have, we can also have like a shattering, a fragmentation of the systems that are not working anymore, are gonna become more apparent. And this can become a fragmentation of our own psyche. So we gotta watch out for that in society how we um, need to be able to include everybody. And that's where the North in Gemini is pointing to the diversity of accepting everything and not uh, kind of alienate people because the moment you do that, they will come back to burn the society. Alienation creates that. So with that said in Aquarius, we're going to kind of get a taste for 
I think kind of for the aquarium age and how, what's to come for us. So that was, um, and that will flavor the nodes since it is the ingress chart. And with an ingress chart, we look as if it was a natal chart for a person. This is going to move and continue to progress. I don't, we'll, we'll go back retrograde into um, Capricorn. But the fact that this is the birth of the, of the nodes into the axis, I think it'll flavor the entire transit. And we have something really important here, two things, is Chiron is squaring and I'm kind of separating square to the nodes in Aries. This is where we can use that mentality coming from the south node of us versus them, my truth versus yours, mine is the one that goes, you need to be banished or you're wrong. This is where it can become warlike because Chiron in Aries is the wounded warrior that lashes out into aggression, into um, attacking. So we need to watch for this. And that could be also the way that we have in patriarchy. We're accustomed to act in that way, in that, through that very toxic masculinity of lashing out, of just throwing a rock or the arrow. <laughs> um, I was going to say that uh, the cryon uh, lashing out and the philosophy of Sagittarius, it, it was making me think that, and I've met several people like this, they use their philosophy, their truths, as a, not to express unity, but as an attack right. to undermine and dismantle. So that that's really important because I I think that works in my chart. <laughs> Thank you. Very much so. Thank you for sharing. That's exactly what we need to watch for uh, with this ingress chart. That, that's the warning of the chart, sort of like watch out for this tendency to use your philosophy, your belief system to attack others and make them wrong and separate and continue with the separation that we have in the world. And it's querying. Um, Squaring both, so it's, uh, as you know, in EA, this is a skip step for the ingress chart. So it is what we need to develop in order to, to move forward, to be able to have this integration in the right way. So a good way to, um, to develop that current in Aries would be to deal with that war within, not attacking others, but to go within the wound. This is what Chiron did. And there was a story here too of Hercules, how he goes to, he's, he's going to challenge someone and he stops at, um, he decides he's gonna go to see Chiron, who was his master, to get advice from him. And he shows up and Chiron is not there. Chiron is with the other centaurs in the forest. So he gets impatient, they're alien. So that's the alien aspect of impatience. Uh, and he asks the center that was there guarding the space to open some wine. And if, as soon as they open the wine, the smell gets to all of the centers and they get very, as they're volatile beings, except for Chiron, who was the only one that was very evolved. They, um, they immediately start rushing back to where uh, their home, thinking that there was a thief or that uh, somebody got into the wine and as Hercules begins to hear their hooves, he gets freaked out because he thinks, what, they, if they don't know it's me, they're going to like run me over. So he starts to shoot arrows up in the sky as a warning to tell them it's just me, it's Hercules. But he's not seeing where he's shooting. So this is how one of the arrows hits uh, and hurts Chiron, his master. And since he dipped the arrows in Hydra's poison, it has no antidote. There's no antidote for it. So now Chiron is wounded. And he goes unwounded forever until he decides to sacrifice himself. And he asks the gods, please put me out of my misery. This is how he creates a lot of the medicine because like going through the wounding, right? But the important part of the story here with this chart is how Chiron did not just lash out at Hercules. He was the guilty party if you just look at it objectively, but he didn't. Instead, he went through the wound. And this is where that, he goes and sacrifices himself. He takes Prometheus' place. And this is how he gets to die and goes up and becomes a constellation of Sagittarius. Um, but this whole thing symbolizes the going within 
and through the wound as opposed to using that to either take vengeance or attack. So this current in Aries is that toxic masculinity that we need to purge out and make it internal and wage that war in a more internal spiritual way. The last thing, uh, there were a few things. Mercury, a uh, ruler of Gemini is in Taurus, which brings in um, this sort of like connecting uh, and the feminine aspect to this, um, to this nodal transit. And Venus is also in Gemini conjunct the North Node. And Venus is in esoteric astrology. It is the, um, not, um, it is the counterpart of Hermes of Gemini. It is what grounds Gemini. It is the goddess, the connective part of earth that really grounds that, that where that just like I'm all over the place. I'm kind of hyper and spastic type of Gemini archetype. So it's really, really interesting that we have that conjunction right there. And then we have Mercury, ruler of Gemini and Taurus kind of pointing, and so is Uranus, pointing to the feminine, pointing to how we can ground in that um, compassion and that gentleness and that connecting to earth to move this um, North Node forward. It brings that aspect to it. Any questions from the English chart? Oh, just a comment that the mm -hmm. moon is in Libra as well. And we are talking about the nodes of the moon. So there we have the moon yeah. in Libra. Yes. Mm. And we have, I think it's making a trine, right? With um, yeah. kind of like a wide, grand trine in the air signs with that moon in Libra. And again, the moon in Libra is bringing us that sense of looking for that balance, looking at both sides of the story. With all this air and this grand trine in the air signs, it's going to bring us the ability to not be so maybe stubborn, but the ability of having more of an open-mindedness and look at both sides and analyze and, and kind of understand, have more of that seeking peace, seeking make peace instead of war type of tendency. So I really like that. Thank you, Linda, because I really like when I saw that the moon is gonna be in Libra. Just, uh, yeah, and we're talking about the moon, moon uh, nodes here. Uh, there was, yeah, I'm not gonna talk about the asteroids right now, I think. So we have enough, we have that wounded masculinity, but we have enough of the um, kind of air feminine coming through as well to balance it off. So I think that if we work with this in the right way, we can make a lot out of this. And I think I'm ready for the other chart. And I th one more thing about um, Gemini and then I'll talk about this, is um, that it represents the opposites, the two polarities. And um, it's really important that we stop, we stop viewing this as bad versus good, as just two. And we kind of expand from here and begin to see this as polarities that need to be integrated within each one of us. So then we have the sacred inner marriage and then we can express the divine self. This is an alchemy, what happens? So instead of, uh, and there can be a tendency with the North Node there to just classify as good, bad, this, this versus that. And this is where the wisdom of Sagittarius comes in and we integrate the whole thing. So pay attention for wherever you have Gemini, that tendency. I think I'm ready now. So, at, and I named this, at some point the nodes will square Neptune and Pisces, or Neptune will square the nodes. And I call this realigning with the nature of truth and surrendering the power of the mind. They will be in orb from approximately October 2020 to the end of February of 2021. And it'll be exact on January 26, 2021. 
as we said before, this, uh, any uh, planet that scores the nodes in EA is a skip step. It's an area where, as a collective or individuals, um, there was something that was left undone, left unlearned, left unworked on. And it's, we, we need to recover this so we can actually move forward wherever the resolution node is or for integration of both. So if we get the chart, Linda, for that square, please. There we go. So what does this mean with the square and what, what can bring for us as individuals or a collective? So for Sagittarius, that Neptune in Pisces is pointing to the need to surrender the idea, even the idea that we can hold the totality of the truth. We cannot. We, the moment that we become separate from the divine, from source, we begin to have a perspective. We're not part of the whole, we begin to have a perspective. So just one perspective, we're a few, but then the more of us there are, the more pers perspectives are there. So we need to surrender this idea that we, our consciousness can hold the totality of the truth because it can hold that, but then there's more. And the more we look, there'll be more. So, and I think the, let me see, the resolution node, it's the, the south node. So that would be important. That's where we have to work the most, at surrendering, surrendering and releasing this. And this can create, especially if we have created an entire philosophy of, of living, the way that we interface with the world. I eat this because I'm vegan, or I follow this teacher because I believe in this, and this gives me a sense of meaning and security in the world. Now, when that gets challenged, this can create a lot of insecurity for the soul. And this is where the touch turn archetype lashes out. And it's like, no, because it's really holding on to that, to that aspect. It feels insecure if somebody else comes and goes, well, that's not the whole truth. I have this truth. And that Neptune in Pisces is pointing to that surrendering, that need to expand and allow for us the knowledge that we can't, have, we can't hold it on, that it's okay if this is our truth. It's okay that other people have theirs and it's okay if they're not with our truth. Uh, we have series there, uh, conjunct Neptune, and Spices and Ceres is the, um, here represents the great cosmic mother, um, bringing that kind of compassion and gentleness to the process and how we can go there to the divine to get nurtured. For ultimate nurturing, nobody else will be able to do it. Everything here is impermanent. People are in our lives, sometimes they're not. So it's pointing to finding that and the cosmic mother as well. And for the, for the North Node, where it collides with Gemini is that Gemini archetype, the need for having all of the facts, all of the information and more information and to really go with the analytical mind. And that square is pointing to the fact that we need to surrender that, that sometimes we're not gonna have all the, all the information that there is to have. And we can still trust in the divine order we can still go to that to make our decisions. And kind of relinquish the need to deify our minds and what we can grasp with it. This will, I think, with this note, will be also the integration and opportunity for us to integrate left and right brain, east and west. Eastern traditions tend to be um, more towards the right brain. The they're more welcoming of the symbolic, the imaginal, the, um, the, the right side of the brain. And we here are more like into, we want to classify things. We want to know where they, are, where they belong. We want to, the scientific method, we value that a lot. So it'll be a great time to integrate both and have that inner marriage because you're both valuable and they both represent the whole. But then the whole is actually more than that. And this is what Saturn, uh, Neptune sorry, is pointing to. The moon will be in Cancer then. So again, we have a lot of feminine um, support. 
really pointing to that gentleness, that compassion, um, what we find in the heart. Yeah. By then we're gonna have a lot of acquiring energy, um, which hopefully will give us the opportunity to objectify and be able to stay more distanced from whatever is triggering us and make those decisions as a collective I'm talking about now. Um, yeah, from a more objective point of view, as opposed to so vested, emotionally vested. Yeah, I think that said, if you, and we can uh, expand and we only have 15 minutes, so I think we should stop. So questions, uh, and this is Damon's chart. Oh, Hi, Damon. Just pointing out that there's no time limit for this meeting. You can go over if you like. And you can go first, Damon, or whoever feels called to go first. Um, like, no pressure on you to, to go first. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what to ask. Mm -hmm. If okay. you would maybe give me a couple of uh, pointers, a couple of suggestions of what you see sure. in my chart. Mm -hmm. uh, the main thing that pops up is, um, so you have Mercury and in Gemini, and it's clearing the nodes. So this is a skip step for you. So that the nodes as they trans transit, they're going to hit that and they're gonna hit your Mars retrograde. There were a few Mars retrograde people in this, um, in this group, it was really interesting. Um, so it'll be an opportunity to, as the North node goes there, to kind of rewrite that story. This is kind of where the North node can help us. How can we um, rewrite the way we've been doing it, release from the past and kind of do this differently? And for you, it'll be a good opportunity to work on that skip step. That's core in your notes. And what does that mean for you? I'm, I'm thinking of the Gemini archetype of uh, relating to people uh, meeting and communicating, picking up information, uh, facts from them. Uh, <clears throat> I've worked quite a, quite a bit on my philosophy and recently uh, I have been having uh, revelations of how to unify all the bits and pieces of information I've been gathering and uh, I'm not sure about the skip steps other than the first thing that comes to mind is maybe I'll be studying more and, and meeting people to help me integrate what I'm studying or get ideas what to study. Does that sound in the ballpark? Yeah. Yeah, it's... Definitely. I'm looking for the resolution node, which is the north node and the fourth. Um, it definitely has to do with the way um, the ideation process, the thought process, the way you communicate with people, with people, with yourself. Um, the Pluto is conjunct the south node, so that tells me that either you bring a lot of the, the lessons from the south, your, your own south node, into fruition, but with the skip step, it's making me think that you bring a lot of them and some are not fully done yet. So you talked about your philosophy and so to me it makes that there is a need to communicate this information in a way that with more compassion, with more of a, um, you know, you have the North Node is in, in the fourth in Pisces. So maybe at relinquishing of the need, and I'm trying to find words, and it's always that way with Pisces, and relinquishing the need of having an agenda and um, like this is my role, this is where I come from, and this is kind of like I'm coming from here. 
when I talk to people, when I share my message, my philosophy, my knowledge, this is a soul that brings a lot of knowledge and a lot of knowledge across many cultures. It's been exploring a lot of, um, with that Pluto, the nature of truth in many ways. So how can we bring that in a way that is more circular with others? And this is kind of like the fourth house that it can come more from the emotional. It can be shared as equals, not so much in your role from up here. Um, great potential to teach and to develop that teaching ability in a more feminine way, if you will, in a more kind of old sage. I'm not sure if I'm explaining that correctly and if it makes any sense for you. I'm, I'm thinking about the, the Mercury in Gemini mm -hmm. and, and wondering how the teaching might be related with that. Well, and the teaching is also related to your Pluto, to your Pluto in the ninth. And, and you have the south node in the 10th. So there, there was, and Jupiter is very close, and Virgo. So there is a huge ability for the, in your mind to, to really analyze information and to look at all kinds of ways of truth systems and systems of belief systems and to like classify them and talk about them. But it can become too mind-oriented. And now there is a need to kind of bring it in a more feeling base. Feeling base, um, intuitive new Neptune as the ruler. I, I feel that, that mm -hmm. I feel that um, I, I, the word that comes to mind is vulnerability, mm -hmm. uh, openness, okay. and uh, I've had better luck uh, trying to find the words and communication uh, analytically. Of course. Than emotionally, because I seem to trigger emotions around people when I start opening up. Mm. And then they need to go where they're going. <laughs> and I'm, I got a strong Pisces, so I want to surrender. I want to let that just happen mm -hmm. and so i'm i'm wondering if the skip step is the mercury maybe i need to be more rooted in facts or they're great communicators gemini mm -hmm. and, and mercury Absolutely. so maybe learning how to communicate better it's more about transmission feels like um, how that resolution notice in the fourth house is ruled by Neptune in the 12th and Scorpio. It's a transmission. Um, so using your words to, tr but maybe not so much in the analytical that you come with great uh, knowledge of, but how can we have more of a transmission of that is more feeling based and to really develop your, your self image around that as opposed to this other that you come from which is that that feels really vulnerable that you know that that really opens me up that way so that yeah. that's very interesting and maybe that little bit of uh uncomfortable feeling you're you're very close to where i need to go with that mm -hmm. i don't want to take any more time but mm -hmm. i thank you very much you're welcome you're welcome And this is Shay, right, Shay? Yes. I can't hear you, but cannot see you. <laughs> okay, hold on. I, that's okay. I mean, if you're okay with it. Let's see. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hear you again. Okay. Yes, I can. Okay. Hi, Shay. So Hi. You, do you have anything you want to share, questions, things that are, I mean, you were, yeah, you were sharing with us the Twin Flame Relationship. Right, right. And yeah. essentially, um, so, you know, I'm, it's, it's very, 
it's manifesting really strongly kind of what you're talking about exactly what what we've been talking about he actually teaches and um he's very close-minded to his you know ways of of thinking and is actually i'm trying to kind of integrate because i am an aquarius and i really don't um are Aquarius rising. And I, I really don't conform to any type of religion. I like to look at all different cultures and all different religions and kind of, you know, make my own philosophy from it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he's like very rigid with it. So I'm just trying to kind of figure out how to get my point across or how to kind of, you know, exactly what you are saying, trying to kind of integrate those two things together and, and take a, you know, the South node and the North node and how to best kind of approach that. Approach him or approach just that issue in general with. Well, Michael's both. Well, both to, because I'm trying to kind of convey that same exact message. So that you're conveying. So how best should I go about doing that? Okay. So so for you, it's going to happen third and then at the cusp of the fourth house. And it's going to hit your Mars retrograde, just like Damon, he had Mars retrograde. So for you, for both of you, there is the need in the souls to reflect. For the most part, this is how it shows up. Reflect a lot on the nature of action, on how you take action in the world. This could have been souls that maybe were too hasty, especially in Gemini, you and this cliche. You have Mars and Gemini in the fourth and it's, um, it's creating a yacht with Chiron and Aries and you have the South Node in the third. So there's a lot of Gemini where it could imply that the soul took, maybe took action in a way that was too hasty and created wounding for others. And now there is the necessity, and I'm saying this because the North Node is going to hit your Mars and activate that yacht that points to you to the North Node. Um... And the fourth house, which is going to very much um, hit at your most inner feelings and your security system. So, um, and this is what you're saying right now. You actually are uh, reflecting on what, how you should approach a situation that, um, that is tricky because you're involved with this person. So um, it's going to start in your third house. So this is the game, the nature of um, how we think, how we communicate, and how we can be open and more open about the whole thing. And thus, the south node is going to be hitting your stalling up in the 10th, kind of releasing. Uh, this is where you can work with that Neptune, that Sun, and that Mercury, and Sag, and use that to release any kind of, um, yeah, fanaticism that you may have around the way that you express yourself in the world, that you uh, that you come, that you're vis visible in the world, your career, what you're doing, and uh, and with that Neptune, it's going to be really watch out for. That's my Neptune to Sag. Any ideas that you have about reality and about your role in the world, about how you how you should be working in the world and appearing and doing, any things that might be delusional around that one, around this whole thing. So there's a great opportunity for release there. And the way that you can approach this situation is by, if you remember the inner marriage of the opposites, that there is room for everything in the totality of creation. And that we all just are expressing versions of reality. And he's expressing his, you're expressing yours. And we cannot make this a battle about, because it continues to separate. So how can you have that inner peace within you and then project that or express that to him? But that would be my best advice on that one. Right. And at the same time, to focus on his, on the other aspects that you really love about him as opposed to this that's really triggering. Right. Learning to love and to accept everything. And uh, maybe by modeling, and I'm not sure because I don't know him, by modeling that he can become more, but it's really important that there is respect and room for everything. Um, 
with this thing. And it's going to hit that Mars in the fourth house, which is, it's really going to hit that inner security. And it's going to give you another opportunity to see how you're taking action in the world. Are you reflecting? Are you taking into account your own feelings, your own emotional needs? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Cedar. Hi. <laughs> um, I don't really have any questions. I guess I was just wondering what the what it means in relation to my chart. You have a lot of Sagittarius, so <laughs> it'll be hitting a lot of your planets. Yeah. A lot, yeah. Um, all up there, so, and the moon is squaring the nodes, so let me see one degree Libra, yeah, it's a little how it's all crooked, so it's throwing yeah. me off, um, yeah, it is, so you actually just went through, or you're about to go in through a nodal return now, huh? yes, so you are going through a lot of stuff, um, and then you're going to get hit, all of your planets are going to get hit with this one, and it's going to activate a lot of stuff for you. Um, so I would say, um, just really pay attention in anything that you can release around all those planetary archetypes, uh, and they, it's going to be around communication that when you communicate in the world, um, the way you, you are visible, the way you, um, have this ideation of, um, who you are, your role your philosophy, it's going to touch everything, the way you connect in the world. The, it's going to touch series too, the way you get nurtured. So really take that opportunity in the way that it triggers you to release any, anywhere where you may have become too stuck on the idea of this is my belief system around this. This is what I need to be doing. This is what I need to be feeling. This is the type of the way I connect with myself and others. Really question all of that and release any, anywhere or try at least where you're kind of touching in that shadowy aspect of Sagittarius. Like I'm getting too fanatic about this. I'm getting too not curious enough. So really question, question everything. Uh, with an open mind, that would be like the Gemini North Node, where it's going to be traveling most of your third. Really bring a lot of curiosity and ask a lot of questions around. You have a, most, a lot of planets out there. So when you get triggered, just really ask the questions and allow for space to the answers to kind of come and show up in different ways in the world, not just from your own belief system, if you will. Right. Okay, cool. So great exploratory time right after your moral return. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Okay, I think we are, we're done, right, Linda? Yes, uh, let me check on Facebook to see if there are any questions. Okay. Okay, no questions, but a nice comment. Someone is saying beautiful, so that's nice. nice. <laughs> okay, well, Barbara, any final thoughts before we uh, wind down? Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for putting this together. Thank, thank you. you. May, I, may um, I ask a question? Yes. <clears throat> there were two things that I was interested in. So I've got planets in the mutable signs. I've got the, um, my uh, moon in Pisces and then the, the Pluto and uh, Jupiter and Virgo and the Mercury and the, Sa the uh, Mercury and Gemini and uh, um, Mars and Sag. And I was wondering how the, 
how the mutable. Are, are you still there? I'm still okay. Here. Uh, I was wondering how the how I've heard that having a lot of mutable can cause fragmentation. And then on the second part of that question is I just recently found out that I've got Pallas at zero degrees Capricorn and I've got Cryon at the beginning of Aries and uh, Uranus at the beginning of Libra and my son in Cancer. So there's a cardinal cross and I heard that cardinals are skip steps <laughs> or something along that line you know making sure that every all the steps are covered so I'm wondering how that might be those would relate to this nodal activation in Gemini and Sag so two things about that I don't quite think that having like a um, lot of mutable means fragmentation necessarily. It may mean indecision and a split, but not fragmentation in the term in the sense of the uranium fragmentation of traumatic fragmentation. More about like the fluidity of the, mu the mutable signs can lead to a lot of indecision and like not knowing. I see all of the options, meaning I have none because I see all of them and I want all of them. So there can be that immutability, <laughs> not necessarily, or a split between two decisions, not necessarily the um, sharp, sort of shocking fragmentation you were talking about. And as far as the cardinal cross, cardinal cross it usually implies a lot of um, action and movement, like a lot of like a need to take action in the soul. But you have Mars retrograde, so I wonder how that's showing up for you in the twelfth house. Um, in the sense that there may be the impulse to take action, but it's also, but there's maybe also something that pulls you back that makes you reflect about is usually Cardinal cross people are very like hasty, hasty in their action taking, but with your Mars retrograde, I would question that and wonder if there is another element where you just don't go and take any action, but kind of like reflect before and then take it. I, it's con, it's really close to my Neptune in the twelfth house, mm -hmm. and with my Pisces moon, I have visions. Mm -hmm. So I I resolve. Uh, I intuitive Sag mm -hmm. get the visions, and so I resolve it all internally. And other people outside of me get really frustrated that I don't have to take action because I've already played it out in my head. Mm. And, and I get the, the 12th house Neptune, I get like knowledge that is not mine. It's like from entities or, it's as if I'm having memories from other people informing me of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's internal in my mind and and I just have to shut that off and be in the moment, be with what, where I'm at. And so the activity is, well, I can do it or not do it. You know, if I wanted to, I could, but I have this vision, this view that says, ah, it's going to work itself out. Why don't I just step out of the way? There you go. Okay. So and that's what I meant. With the Mars retrograde, I was questioning if that cardinal cross was really manifesting in that way for you. And it's not. Because this whole thing here is kind of like bringing it into a different dimension of action where you are able to kind of surrender that, that action taken, that Mars, to the divine. And you get out of the way and you kind of allow it to kind of happen for you. Okay. Thank uh, you. You're doing that. Uh, so... What, how that relates to everything else through the transiting nodes, you mean? Yeah. Well, it's gonna hit that Mars uh, towards the end, uh, that Mars retrograde. And um, it'll be definitely an opportunity for you to, um, to kind of explore and, uh, and release anything that's shadowy in that, in that way that you do this. So I would pay attention to that. It's right there with Neptune, so there could be a maybe like a blurry vision around this that might, that might need to get cleared up. 
and um, and then the north node is pointing to that um, kind of it starts. Let me see your Gemini. Yeah, it's in the seventh house. So how to use that that other ability that you have to discriminate to kind of clear out this um, this kind of delusion that it could be there or this blur vision. So uh, through facts and one-on-one -on -one relationships, seventh house, uh, and relating to people, I can help clear out my blurry vision or delusions that I may have that are not bringing clarity. Yeah, and it's opposite Venus in the sixth house. So um, definitely learning to discriminate. Definitely okay. learning discriminate maybe before you communicate it discriminate what needs to be said from what doesn't how you take action with your words basically because this is how you're taking action and um and discriminate from what needs to be communicated what doesn't what belongs to you what doesn't what's a projection what's not and kind of work with that thank you then you, you, you don't get people pissed off maybe. So you maybe learn to kind of balance that a little better. You know, that Mercury is in the seventh house looking for balance after all, between how I, you communicate with others, and what's shared and what's not. I find that Gemini are very playful. Mm -hmm. So learning to play, word play, playing with my words and disarming so that I don't come across, because I can, that energy of the cardinal can be overwhelming. Yeah, <laughs> I have a few family members with that, so I, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the end of your meeting, Barbara. Thank you so much. and. Thank you to the volunteers, Damon, Cedar and Shay. And uh, thank you from all of us here, unmuting everyone. Would you all please thank Barbara Yurovich Arias, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you guys, thank you. <laughs> Bless you.